Hi guys, Panda here. What you're about to listen to is a review podcast where a few friends and I sat down and talked about Batman the Killing Joke that was in cinemas on the 24th of July, 2016 in Melbourne. Now, uh, there's going to be a couple of adult topics and controversial topics here uh, in this episode. Um, this is just for uh, a disclaimer. Um, we don't generally talk about controversial things, but as it relates back to pop culture and movies, um, we thought that we might just leave it as that it does involve a few scenes in this movie. Now, I hope you enjoy. You, oh. you don't have a reputation. Yeah. Soon to be rock star, Mr. Tim. I like okay. oh. Well, um, I'm Panda, and this is the Panda Podcast. This is just a special episode that we're going to do to review uh, The Killing Joke. We had the opportunity to watch it in Melbourne. Uh, last weekend, which was the 22nd of July, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 22nd of July, yeah. um, 24th of July, 24th. with me today bad. is um, ML from uh, Medium Talk, from Medium Talk, yeah. um, if you guys listen to Medium Talk, check out their channel, they've, they've retired, but mm-hmm. um, still plenty of apps up on archives, I've, uh, I've dragged a mill out of retirement. <laughs> um, worth it. <laughs> worth it. Just, just, just to talk about this particular movie that mm. we watched. Um, also with me today is Mr. Tim. Uh, I'm no one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you might know him from some gig you saw. <laughs> Not even that. Not even that. Um, so, we watched, uh, me and Tim, we watched um, The Killing Joke at the Kino Cinema, mm-hmm. and you watched it Emil, at... The Rivoli Theatre in Camberwell. It's actually kind of nice, it's a village cinema. So, at our cinema, before we go into the movie, um, mm-hmm. they were giving away posters, which I was kind of pissed that I didn't get one because I actually do, I really wanted a poster and apparently they only had two per cinema oh so wow <laughs> yeah. so, no, I don't even know if they had that at the Rivoli I'm, either they did and I missed it completely or they didn't at all I don't know oh, to say. but uh, I want to get my hands on um, a poster and I also want to get my hands on the Blu-ray mm. that is coming out I believe this next week Next week, I think it was the 3rd of August, the movie comes out. So, um, let's get to it, boys. Uh, this, this, this podcast, this special podcast about this movie, what it called a review cast, um, will be containing a lot of spoilers. Let's, um, and swearing. And, and swearing. Definitely. And, uh, and some hot topics. Definitely that, too. Um, so, if you haven't seen The Killing Joke... And you are sensitive to hot topics in the news or general violence. I would suggest um, that you go watch The Killing Joke before you continue listening to the podcast. Um, but let's go with what we thought about the movie. Um, so the movie, as most of us will know, is a adaptation of a graphic novel by Alan Moore um, and so the movie is out in 2016 about 30 years apart for a movie that came out for a movie that's part of a comic book 30 years ago the the demographic society is different like people will perceive things in different ways mm. um, and the movie had some hot topics regarding that now if you if you're like me and you didn't read the graphic novel before going to see the movie and people shaming you for it um, you will know that the first 20 minutes of the movie was all new footage yeah the first 40 minutes it's like half an hour yeah probably about that I feel it feels that way anyway but yeah you're right it was just completely original story that they added on probably because the comic itself is quite short yeah so that's, that's, that's what I was told, um, that like it was a great, iconic graphic novel, but it was too short to turn into a movie. Yeah. Um, and even then, the first 10 minutes was 
the career of Mark Hamill. Mm. Yeah, so at, um, and I, I assume at all showings, they just had a little clip uh, where Mark Hamill was being interviewed, I guess, uh, about his life, really, and slowly his part in playing the Joker and being the Joker for the last few years. I was kind of confused. I was looking at Tim when the, uh, like the opening dialogue of uh, Mark Hamill's real... Yeah, of like yeah. Mark, Mark Hamill and George Lucas and how he's talking about his Star Wars days. I'm like, hey, Tim, are we... Like, like Mark Hamill's part of the movie, but like, are we, are we here for something else, man? Could we just... I mean, like, right before that, during the trailers, they showed all these movies. The last one they showed was Rogue One. Oh, right. I was like, oh, well, okay, oh, I'll, I'll go with this. I mean, hey, if I got a surprise early Rogue One screening, I would not be that late, <laughs> to yeah. be fair. Um, so, like, it was it was interesting to see Mark Hamill's uh, film career for, this, for the first 15 minutes. He goes from Star Wars to Batman, the anime series, to the Arkham games, um, to The Killing Joke. So if you were a fan of the Batman the Anime series, uh, you would know that uh, Mark Hamill also plays the Joker there, and he plays the Joker in the Arkham games. Um, he did retire his voice from the Joker after Arkham City, um, after 20 years? 20 years. Yeah. 20, oh, 19. Yeah. 19 years. 92 was the anime. Like yeah, doing doing the voice of the Joker is quite stressful. Like even doing an impersonation of it is hard on your voice. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to encourage us to do impersonations right no. now. No, I, I would love to do it, but I would just <laughs> sound like a madman. Um, you know, in, <laughs> yes, in in the in, in the clip, he um, I believe someone mentions. I think talking about him, perhaps it was um, that. A whole generation has basically grown up with him being the voice, the one and only voice that they've ever heard. Mm. Um, and people, when they think of the Joker, will just think of him. Don't think Nicholson. Yes. <laughs> Don't think Nicholson. But I wonder also if, um, I think, people who are around my age, I was born in 96, uh, might maybe associate the Joker more with um, the Nolan movies at this Ledger. point. Yeah, with yeah, Heath Ledger. He, he Ledger's Joker. The live action. Yes. Yep. Yep. I'd say definitely. So I was, yeah. I was born in 93, but my first Joker would have been definitely Mark Hamill's Joker. Um, I found out about Nicholson's Joker um, way after, and then you would get the Nolan movies, and then now you'll also get... Yeah. The Jared probably, Leto. Probably mm. like kids like they say ten years left, um, older than us will probably be that way. Yeah, yeah. Jared Leto. That yeah. would be interesting. I, I'm keen to see what goes on there. Um, so that 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 was the first 15 minutes of the movie. It was pretty much my camel was the movie for 15 minutes. Mm. Um, then it goes into the I would call it the the Batgirl arc of the movie. So the first 20 minutes of original footage. Um, which was meant to showcase, was, which was meant to emphasize more on Batgirl's story, I guess. Mm. Uh, solely because the graphic novel didn't really explain who she was or what role she plays in Batman's life. Yeah, um, and I assume it's because the writers assumed that the readers would have that knowledge, possibly. Yeah, but I think. Yes, definitely because to um, develop the character more in the story and also probably because The Killing Joke itself is so short as a, as a story mm. that they definitely needed something to make it a full-length feature movie. And adding adding more um, detail to Batgirl as a character is probably not a bad way to do that, I would say. No, it was... It was, it was I would say it was a good choice. Mm -hmm. Um based on what was to come afterwards. Um, we also didn't mention that uh, Kevin Conroy returned as the Batman. Mm, mm. And, and Tara, Tara, Tara Strong yeah. as Batgirl. See, I didn't know Tara Strong voiced Batgirl previously, um, but I knew her as um, 
she plays uh, Bubbles. In oh yeah, Powerpuff Girls. So she does. And I, she, I think she voices one of the Ben Ten characters. Ah. Uh, oh really? Really? Okay. So like the early Bart Simpsons or? Yeah, she's like the star. Wait, so Charles Strong has been the voice of the Sim- of Bart Simpson. Yeah. And Ralph. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I thought it was a much older woman, but okay. Huh. Oh. Um, not knowing how talented old. voice actress. Not, not not knowing how old Power Strong actually is. Yeah, good point. I tell you what, there were shots of Mark Hamill um, in the recording booth with his glasses on that I just I didn't even realize it was him. I don't yeah. recognize him anymore. He he has aged as you yeah as, as you as you'd expect. Yeah, it's been a fair few years. Um, we we went straight into the movie, but the production team. Of the movie we haven't even mentioned yet. We got the original Bruce Tim mm-hmm. is back. Brian Azzarello is back. Um, Kevin Conway is back. Mark Hamill's back. Um, and I think it was just the main production team that was a part of the Batman mm-hmm. anime series, and the style of it was pretty much the same style as well. Um, I actually had more like the first half that new com- that completely new story arc felt like completely felt like the modern like tens kind of movies. Like under the red hood and all that. Right. Yeah. 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 Once, and then the second half completely felt like eighties killing Jack Gotham and all that. So you think the animation style shifted? Just the wasn't really the animation style even. Like just the look, the look of the city just felt completely different to me. The whole setting, you mean? Yeah. Like yeah. the whole setting and all that, and just the vibe. Like the first half felt completely contemporary, and then it went into like the eighties for me. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it, it did it did sort of interweave a couple of scenes here and there, I guess. I mean, like, you know, like, um, Barbara using the computer or whatever, you know, would be in, be in there to sort of cast it back. Because back then, she would have been just the librarian. Yeah. you got to remember, this is 1980s Batgirl, not modern Batgirl that turns into the Oracle and then back to Batgirl again. Um... So this is like the the original Barbara Gordon, the original take on Barbara Gordon. Right. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so we've got the first twenty minutes of Batgirl mm-hmm. um, telling her backstory, um, and then we have the rest of the movie, which was a killing joke. Um, what did you guys think of the movie? Just okay on well, on an individual scale. Because we've we've all heard of the movie, we've all we all know mm, somewhat as to what plays out in the movie mm-hmm. uh, towards the end, um, but the actual execution from graphic novel to film to animation, what do you guys think? Well, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, in terms of adaptation wise, I think they did a pretty good job. Um, you know. As DCAU movies usually are, they were quite faithful to the source material, mm. obviously minus the original uh, edition. Um, in terms of just the experience of the movie itself, I I don't know if it really held up to my expectations. And at that point, I could blame my expectations for that. <laughs> you know, that's a thing. That so happens. if you didn't have expectations, you walk into the movie and you thought it would have been a great movie. Maybe. I don't know though, because even even given that, I think my expectations weren't that high. They just still weren't met that well. Perhaps because I thought I thought that more would happen. But again, I guess the actual killing joke is so short that you can't really. I get, I mean, I also hadn't read the comic until after the movie, mm. um, so I had really no sense of scale for what how big the story really was. I just assumed it was going to be bigger, but that's not really. The, the movie's fault. Overall, though, I still think it's okay. Just not. Uh, I thought it was going to be the peak of of DCAU movies. I expected it to be, and it just wasn't, in my opinion. Tim. Yeah. Um. I agree. I'd say like good faithful adaptation. I probably think rather than having like all the filler, I think they could have probably just interweaved it throughout the whole thing. Mm. Perhaps maybe don't like rather than just like spending all that time on the pillow with the entire first half of it and nothing else in between aside from slightly um, stretching out the panels a bit more um, yeah just like maybe like because all that seemed to do really was just um, make the, 
you a field in more of Bobby Gordon and all that. Mm -hmm. Just like flesh out a character a bit more. Yeah. Where we could have just flushed out the whole story more. At the same time. Of, yeah. Yeah. But did you read the graphic novel before? Yeah, I read it two years ago. Hmm. Um, well, I didn't. I didn't obviously didn't read the graphic novel before going into the movie. I knew. I knew what would happen, just based off what is around the internet. Mm -hmm, and you mm -hmm. could just go on a wiki page and read what the Killing Joke is about. Oh, I did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, just being a Batman fan, you know that. Yeah, um, that oh, Barbara Gordon goes into a wheelchair. Yeah. How you find out? Then she becomes Oracle. Yeah. And so on and so forth. Um, but I thought the movie was like I I I agree with Wimmel that um, I th went into the movie thinking that it would be DC's best animated movie mm -hmm. because of the team that was coming back for it um, and I was a little bit underwhelmed like I can understand that their source material is something from 30 years ago mm -hmm. and they want to be faithful with the source material um, to create you know a one-to-one -one direct trans translation um, but I think that we've in the last Know, 15 or so years we've just watched so many DC uh, animated movies that okay this is a good movie but Under the Red Hood was better mm, mm, or yeah. First Year was better or yeah. the new Sam Liu movies um, The Dark uh, Apocalypse was better or Batman and Superman movies were better um, or uh Throne of Atlantis was better. Mm, right. <coughs> um, but this, to me, was a very really nostalgic movie in the art style, for one. Um, and it was good to see, um, because the, the comic book itself was iconic for having uh, issues. Um, mm -hmm. It tackled issues of I think well not not I think but like I had issues back in the 80s um, with violence against women mm -hmm. um, just the key factor where Barbara Gordon gets shot and she becomes um, immobile um, that caused issues and I think people were speculating that Okay, they're gonna make the killing joke. They're gonna fuck it up, and um, it's going to make this topic that's been around for more than thirty years a bigger thing than it was. Mm -hmm. um, granted, though, the movie in itself was about the Joker and the comic as well. Definitely. Yeah, the dynamic that was. I'd say it doesn't quite it wasn't the key focus like that comic and then the movie especially like they both both of them are just about the dynamic between Batman and, and um, the Joker like mm. when he first um, goes off into Arkham Asylum which is to have that talk with him which is where the comic book starts but it's halfway through the yeah. movie mm. yeah like, they don't, they don't show that the whole bit when he goes in because I haven't read it for like two years do they not show the that instantly where it starts off. It's it starts instantly with well him. Yeah, it's case. Well, it no, it, it's him outside the gates of Arkham, oh, okay. and then he walks into Arkham with oh, Gordon, yeah. and then goes to the cell. I thought it started. Okay, I thought it started when they find those bodies. No, no, yeah. which is. I, <laughs> I don't think that he even shows the bodies in the comic, if I if I'm not mistaken. I don't. Um, it just goes. Yeah, yeah well, because. Well, actually, I kind of liked it better that way. To be fair, I, that was one. Just came in yeah, well, there's here's here's the thing. Like there, there are a few changes. Uh, it, as faithful as the ad adaptation was, there were a few minor changes aside again from the original, even to the part which was strictly meant to be the comic. There were still some minor changes, which I think did change overall some of the significance of the scenes. So, for example, 
Starting on um, Batman going to visit the Joker based on him finding bodies is one thing. Starting on the Batman going to visit the Joker for the sole purpose of trying to have a rational conversation with him has a different thing. Yeah. It, because it felt like Batman was there, in the movie that is, the Batman was there at the cell to talk to Joker about the bodies, but then also wanted to use this opportunity. Yeah. Whereas in the comic, it's definitely all about the, the dynamic between the two from the very beginning. Yes, definitely. That's what I think, anyway. Hmm. Um, so, at, at the core of the movie, mm -hmm. it is about Batman and the Joker's relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and just, unfortunately, Batgirl had to be the, the medium... Mm, that, wow. that that caused him to kind of go crazy, I guess is, is the right word to use. Just sort of a plot device. Yeah. But like, and, yeah, I mean... It seems like they just... That's probably my main gripe, maybe, with the movie. Is okay. the adaptation and, and the feel. Is that instead of actually, like I said, working out the, the actual story and adding more bits to that, they just—it seems like they've just tried to um, make an excuse a bit for Barbara Gordon as a plot device in the original comic. Yeah, like yeah. having more backstory in that whole first arc. So you, th yeah. So you think that um, they tried to make her more of a plot device? No, they tried, uh, tried to make it more. They tried to. Um, uh, what's the word? They tried to redeem. Uh, I guess what the original comic did, where she just mm. gets shot and all that. And it's like, if you come in for it, into it for the first time, that's the first Batman book you ever read. You're not going to know who, we, um, who she is yeah. or her past or anything. So they tried to, I think, redeem that. Did like, they even you know, show her in her bat suit? In no, not in the comic, no. It's so the only scene is um, when she gets shot by the Joker and also when Batman is to in hospital. It's like probably like um, trying to just make up for what that did in the comics yeah. by like um, for like brand new viewers by giving them a better experience of it in the movie when they come in. Yeah, because uh, like uh, if you were to show that in the movie, you'll go, "Yeah, who is, it? Who is this character?" Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, do I have to know something before going into this movie? Yeah. So, like, obviously, the point of the first twenty minutes to emphasize who she is. Yeah, in Batman's life. Because to be fair, if you didn't have those first twenty minutes, um, you'd have about two minutes of, oh, there must be Barbara Gordon because she's with Commissioner Gordon, and oh look, and now she's shot, and that that'd be your introduction to Barbara Gordon. So, yeah, yeah I can understand why they wanted to do that. Absolutely. I mean, I think also, like you said, they're maybe trying to make up for the fact that they didn't really spend that time in the comic in, originally yeah. in the first place, doing fleshing her out. Um, and you know, as as they have been then, and and it has grown since, to this day, there there's always a constant issue of. Uh, I don't want to get, you know, too into this, but uh, there was a the constant issue of gender roles in media, mm -hmm. and people always well around this movie anyway. People bring that up a lot because people feel that Barbara being a plot device is a bit meager as a as a role for for her, and that's not entirely wrong although perhaps that may be laboring a point there where you don't really need to because um, I find often enough in plots <clears throat> in plots in general you you want to try and give motivation to characters and often it's through loss and Batman has that sort of motivation many times um, mo probably the most yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. And maybe you know, another notable case other than his origin is, say... Um, the death with, of Jason Todd. With Jason Todd, exactly. And I would see um, our Barbara being shot the same way I would see Jason Todd. I wouldn't see it as belittling her role yeah. as a character. Um, the fact that it didn't give much um, dimension to her is probably what most people have against it, and that's what they try to fix. And I guess that's good, but... Yeah. They strengthen that relationship between Barbara Gordon and Batgirl with Batman in the first 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, and gave, uh, it gave the audience more of a reason 
for Batman to go after the Joker. Yeah. Um, not that Batman would have not gone after the Joker anyway. Yes. But yeah. it became personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It became very personal. And um, even then, I mean, that kind of backfired on them as well. Like, because that's pretty, that's been a bit of a controversial thing, though. The fact that they had to put that in there. Yeah, yeah. Which I think, I don't, I don't think it's deserved at all. See, the, the controversy here is, um, after we watch the movie, um, what, I, what I tend to do is, I want to go online and see what other people think and how this movie went in the box office and so on and so forth. Not that it really alters my opinion on it, um, but the first thing I saw was um, a couple of articles online talking about the controversy between the relationship of Batgirl and Batman. And apparently that is not part of the source material at all, obviously being the first 20 minutes, um, not having any relationship to the killing joke, um, which, you know, if, you did, if you're still listening and you, you've, seen, you've watched the movie, you know that um, Batgirl fights Batman on the rooftop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very briefly. They're briefly just having a go at each other. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Batgirl pins Batman and then they suddenly start making out and they have sex. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just going to ask you guys quickly, did that catch you by surprise? Yes. Because oh. it sure oh, is. Oh, definitely did. did. Yeah. I definitely was just, did. I was like, kiss maybe. And then when it, it escalated from there, I was just... It right. got everyone what? watched the entire theater. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt. Um, and then... Like, okay, so, and then they re-emphasize that point later on where she calls up Batman and goes, oh, it was just sex. Yeah. It was just sex. I'm like, okay, sure, we, we, we get it. Yeah. You guys banged. I mean, yeah, there's a couple of times where in the first 20 minutes they do some very, very subtle fourth wall breaking. So at the very start of the 20 minute back up piece... She, she starts with now I know this is not how most of you expect this to start or something along those lines yeah, yeah. which is clearly a reference to people who have either read the comic or know about it they know they should know that it doesn't start with a background monologue at all but um, they were addressing that and I'm sure in, in that phone call that was also indirectly meant towards the, the viewers as well it's like yeah it was just sex guys don't freak out too much yeah but people did freak out um, now how do you guys feel about that scene Look, um, if, if, if you guys are fans of the Batman the Anime series and mm-hmm. Batman Beyond and even Batman Beyond 2.0, uh, which is a sequel or a reboot of the Batman Beyond universe, um, they did mention that they had a relationship. Yeah. Um, and in an issue of Batman Beyond 2.0, um, Barbara Gordon is pregnant with Bruce Wayne's kid right uh-huh. so like to me watching that scene in the movie was like okay um, but then I went back and realised this is a new news this is something that's been in uh, the comic book world for a while yeah I mean yeah it is part of the mythos for sure I mean and, I, and you can also highlight other examples of um, that sort of emotion being thrown around between the two characters, say in Mask of the Phantasm, which was one of the early animated movies, um, and in that one you see Barbara being very flirtatious with Bruce yeah. for a lot of it. Yeah, so, there was a history of Batgirl having an obsession with Batman mm. because she's not, I guess originally she's not part of the Bat family. No, uh, she shoehorns her way in, yeah. basically. And you would have to assume that she has some level of admiration, at least, for Batman to yes. do that. Um, so, yeah, that we, we know that there is some obsession with Batman there, which, in the movie, turned into sex. Like, okay, yeah. wow. I, f- I feel like there's a lot of outcry there for a couple of reasons, though. Um, mm-hmm. Especially if you, like like myself, I suppose, I, are mostly connected to the whole mythos via the animated movies mm-hmm. um, and not the comics, mm-hmm. uh, then I guess other than Batman Beyond 2.0, 
this strikes you as very out of character for Batman because very rarely does Batman engage in that sort of activity, period. Mm -hmm. Even with the people that he has no love interest with, say Catwoman or Talia al Ghul. Yeah. Um, so even if with those characters they don't get... The characters that he's meant to have a love interest with, you know, that developed one. That they, is, they just disappear. Or yeah. And yet this other character for, to whom he's meant to be... A father figure almost. Yeah. More of a parent, really. Um, for them to have a sex scene just seems really out of uh, out of place, I guess. Um, because you just don't think... It, it's, it's, it feels like it's breaking some of the Batman maxims that it, he has. It, it, it's, it's breaking a lot of even social mm. conceptions of... Uh, you're meant to be a father figure to this kid yeah. who, in I guess, in retrospect, is the same age as your adopted son yeah uh, Dick Grayson the first Robin Nightwing exactly so they're about the same age um, what's happening there yeah right like th that age gap you know is also probably another reason why you could frown upon it although I mean that's I guess a different argument altogether but yeah so I, I feel like I feel like if you want because like you said right it exists in the mythos um, so that part isn't really the problem I think putting it there and then where they did, yeah, it just didn't really making fit. it making it um, like even as a Batman fan, if you don't get too deep into the mythos and every single issue and every single issue that comes up in the comics, um, your the, the general I think the general um, assumption would be uh, you know Batman, you know Joker, uh, you know Batgirl, you know Robin, you know Alfred. Yep. Um, and they're a team and they fight crime and that's what they do and you've got bad guys everywhere mm -hmm. and putting this sort of controversial topic into a movie that's being released to the public not just not just to um, comic book fans but out there into the world um, on in a cinematic scale yeah is a lot more likely to see it yeah yeah, yeah. 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 as opposed to for instance the Batman Beyond comic where eh, it's a comic book not everyone's going to go pick up a comic book yeah, exactly. and it's going to be like a mainly an issue to the comic book readers um, so that was a really bold part on the creative yeah. team there but overall I don't think it ruins it or anything necessarily it is disconcerting maybe and definitely surprising as we mentioned but I feel like you can look past it if you really try um I think overall, though, it's uh, well as you mentioned, Tim. It's like the the fact that maybe the twenty minutes beforehand felt possibly too segmented, possibly like it didn't really go anywhere. I mean, it did develop her character, true, but other than that, it felt like it didn't really have much of a a, a route to follow. It sort of hits a dead end and then just starts the comic, which has no connection at all. It, it definitely would have been a writing challenge, I think, to try and incorporate the two in more artistically, like. Trying, trying to meld those texts together could have either gone really bad or really, really good. You know, it's hard to say. So I can I can respect the decision to try and keep it separate. Um, but it just doesn't do much for the movie to do that in the end, sadly. Another topic that has come up in this controversy is um, the additional scene of um, Batman hunting down the Joker. And in the process, he... Um, approaches a couple of street girls mm. uh, yeah. and uh, just asks them have you seen a Joker and one of them goes uh, no we haven't um, but when he's normally out he comes and visits us That's to count somewhere else. Yeah. yeah which people interpret as a loose reference to him have basically replacing that someone else with Barbara Gordon yeah in a in a uh, maybe in an abusive way yes I'm, I'm not quite sure why and actually, why like why people have seen the movie have gone all up in arms about that? Because that that interpretation could easily have been taken from the comic. That too, yes. Yeah. They leave everything like aside from like the pictures of her naked after having gotten shot. We don't actually know what like the extent of the damage is done. For all we know, you went through in the comic as well. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, because the comic doesn't have the scene with yeah. the escorts in it. No, it's it, got it in the panel. 
Does it? Oh, yeah, okay. it but it, I don't think it has a dialogue. Does it? Yeah, it doesn't have. Yeah. Yeah. Does yeah. have so, uh, when you like face up the guy by his voice or face to Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just the scene with the Joker taking the pictures is suggestive enough. And you still have Harvey Bullock then say, oh, you didn't hear, you know, that's messed up shit. Which messed up shit has no further description to it. So yeah, it could have happened in the comic as well. Although I think... Um, See, walking out of the movie, uh, I didn't really think that at yeah. all. I, I thought maybe, but I was pretty sure it wasn't what actually transpired. And I think if you find Alan's, Alan Moore's fault on it, he never really saw it going that way either. Yeah. And I think even even if you think of the Joker's character, you still think, yeah, um, I mean, not. I'm sure he's not. He's crazy, it's, but... Yeah. It's like what Mark Hamill said, though, in that interview, though. Yeah. Like, the reason why he likes him is because he's unpredictable. Yes. Like, you like... With Harley Quinn, he gets you off, he gets you off on feeding her. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's gone down that way too. I'm not gonna oh, say. Oh yeah, I didn't even think of that. I'm not gonna stay. I'm. Yeah. yeah I'm not gonna go. I think he definitely wrecked her. No. I don't think he did. I just. I leave it open to interpretation. Sure. Honestly. And um, did well. So walking out of the movie, did you think that at all? No, I wasn't thinking. That no, I was thinking about. I was just thinking. Yeah. I was basically comparing. Because they add, they did add a few little expansions to it, mm. like mainly the panels and all that, and the extra, the mirror room, where instead of smashing through the window and like fighting the Joker instantly, they have that whole extra room of um, the upside down room in Shinji's house, which I actually thought was probably my favorite. That was a that was a great scene. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that added a lot to that. Um, uh, in case people are wondering the context exactly, it, the Joker has a lot of flashbacks in the comic. One of them being a flashback to his shitty little house if I had an origin story I would, I would like it to be a multiple choice yeah yeah that, that's what I was thinking actually because then like even then that's not supposed to be there is no definitive no. origin of the Joker that's just his most popular so the fact that he did at, at the same time I liked the addition of the upside down house that was a surreal kind of Joker element yeah more so than the basic kind of stuff but yeah then, absolutely then it's still like acknowledges that he he considers it to be his origin and kind of yeah. that element of I guess I mean the Joker has always been an interesting character for me because um, he's easily one of my favorites also though that that's a, as a character like the, the actual motivations and the actions of the character itself I find completely despicable obviously yeah. that's the whole point but I love the character for it and I think, it, like you said, Tim, a huge part of that is the mystery to the Joker. Not knowing his true origins, it adds so much to him because it just makes him as close as you can get to a, a ball of pure white crazy, basically. He is pretty close to that. Um, you know, because he does have, you, you know... I always find it difficult, for example, when um, villains in maybe anywhere, really, but I suppose even uh, especially... Uh, hero stories, superhero stories. Yeah, villains are given the very, very bland role of just being villainous for villain's sake. Which I usually, want to, I want to destroy the world. I want to rob this bank. I want to beat Superman. Yeah, I mean it's it's all very generic. And either so either the character has understandable motivations such as greed, or they lack any motivation and they're just evil for the sake of being evil. Which is both both of which are quite boring. Yeah, I find after some time, but the Joker somehow even without having any distinct motivation, that that comes to his advantage in the end. The fact that he really is in this for the ride completely, I can buy that. I can buy that because of his madness. Whereas previously he's like ah oh, power hungry whatever, but the Joker is bigger than that. And to have to have his secret reveal would probably detract from him. But that said, I do believe. I don't wish to be quite on this. Uh, I do believe that the comics now are moving towards trying to unveil more yes. of the story. Um, so if anyone's following the comic book, um, there is a uh, new quote-unquote um, truth to the Joker's origin. Mm -hmm. um, it was revealed in, I think, Batman Rebirth Zero, or number one. 
that there are three Jokers in the new Fifty Two universe. Yeah, which is which is like okay, fine, but this is gonna be this is gonna be weird. Yeah, I I might choose to ignore it, as I like to choose to ignore a lot of stories in mythologies that I don't like. I mean, you know, like you can really interpret a whole you know canon if you want. Well, then, it, like the whole point of being um, unpredictable and just being crazy. Now we have, we have three of them. Mm. So if stuff happens in the comic book, we aren't going to assume that this is the same guy over and over again. This is one dose of crazy. This is the same dose of crazy from a second guy and the same dose of crazy from a third guy. I'm like, okay, so who is Batman fighting really? And what is the Joker mm, mm. In, in that respect? Because, like, as the Killing Joke tells us, um, and what most people interpret is that the Joker's origin is um, a, a heist that's gone bad yeah. while under the identity of the Red Hood. Yep. Um, and most people have taken that as the origin of the Joker. Um, so now, with Rebirth, like, so, which one of you was the Red Hood? Um, which one of you fell into the, uh, the, the acid, the, yeah. acid uh, the pot of acid, the pot isn't big enough to fill no. up. The, the, the um, silo. The silo of acid. Um, and why did you turn crazy? Mm. See, even, even in the common joke, which does give that origin story, to it, um, even in there, it still isn't nailed down as definitive by the Joker himself. Yeah, and that's what I love because I, I wish I could remember the name of the comic now. But there's another comic I remember um, quote reading quote end quote. Um, it was from that channel, um, comic story. Anyway. Comic story. Comic historian. Anyway, um, there's, a, there's this great guy on YouTube called Comic Story where he breaks down. Um, volumes of uh, gra- uh, co- graphic novels, comic stories, arcs, and it just condenses it into like five, ten minute videos. Mm-hmm. And in this one, I, I'll try and find its name later. Um, in this one, the Joker basically um, kidnaps a bunch of inmates and a doctor from Arkham and tells them each a different Right, I've just read this one. I bet, uh, I've this isn't a serious house, I'm serious. Is it? <sighs> that... Don't know. And one of them is the nurse, and one of them is like a, uh, someone inside the hospital. Yeah, and so they're all they're all given, um, all of them are given these different variations of the Joker's origin, one crazier than the next. Yeah. Um, and the whole comic itself again ends on the note of you don't really know which one it is. All you do know is that the Joker is crazy still. Yeah. Um, and I think I love that too much to want to dedicate myself to any one story. Yeah. So. Even even with the new developments in the comics, I think I'll just accept them as possible theories. Yeah. Much like you can accept a possible theory in the Killing Joke uh, as that being the origin story. What it was? Yeah. Why not? Just part of part of part of it all. It's part of the mystery. Yeah. Right. I, I'll see it that way as intrigue rather than as an answer. Yeah. Because I think uh, the Joker is best left unanswered, mm-hmm. just because if we know his identity, we can then trace that to being his source of crazy yeah um, but in the killing joke he's his source of crazy was just one bad day mm. I'm just gonna pull quotes now from the movie yeah <laughs> um, but yeah no that's that's true and even the one bad day reference isn't just well it, it's mainly used for the Joker in that context but I guess then um, you can relate that to almost everyone in the movie. Every a lot of comics in general, basically. No, but even just True. On, on the perp- yeah, yeah, in comics, like every superhero has one bad day that turns them into who they are. Yeah. Um, but even the in 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 the movie, you have like people. Um, you got Commissioner Gordon, just one bad day, some crazy clown goes into your house and 
shoots your daughter, you get kidnapped, and you go through a torture chamber. Mm. Um, and then you've got obviously Bat uh, Batgirl's bad day. I guess she has two bad days in this movie. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Three, three bad days. She just, she just has a lot of bad days in this movie. Yeah. Um, with the with the scene with Gordon's sort of torture chamber, torture chamber, for which that that was the whole point for the Joker was to try and break him to show that anyone would give in to insanity under the same circumstances. Um, now there's there's um, there's a whole musical section to it uh, where the Joker sings a very perverse song about insanity, basically. Yeah. Um, now. And I would ask your opinion, but Tim, you actually read the comic before, um, and I was wondering what you thought about that because in the comic, you uh, you can't hear the music, obviously. And, no, and it's you know it's just very it's it, it, pretty, it's, it's, just, just a, it's just words on a piece of paper exactly, yeah. and it's just the lyri- it's just the lyrics that really creep you out. Yeah, um, it is definitely it has a sh- yeah shitload more impact in the movie because mm. set to this disturbing like horrible vaudeville number yeah exactly like, the usual theatrical roots of the Joker where as you if you read it in the comics I don't recall how I read it but I wouldn't have obviously wouldn't have been able to like take in the kind of tone that the movie brought in yeah so yeah that I think was definitely a lot that scene was a lot more successful Go on. the adaptation I have to ask I have to ask your opinion of that because by the time I read it uh, after the movie as I was reading it all I could do was yeah, hear yeah, that voice yeah. and, and oh, that I song didn't have that so yeah, now I was wondering, but I, yeah, I thought that would probably add to it at the very least. Yeah. Um, although, um, and the reason that was even such a focus was because, um, as we said before, before the movie, there's the Mark Hamill interview, then there's a the movie. At the end of the movie, they also show a small special on the music and orchestra that went behind the movie. Yeah. Um, Which was interesting because. I tried to find out how the audience left. Yeah, yeah. The, the yeah. thought, okay, no credits are rolling. The Oracle scene's the last yeah. little end credits bit, and they go, I looked, I turned around after, and like half the audience was there. Like, yeah. Like 10 of us. Yeah, you guys, you guys aren't here, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it was interesting. Um, although, it, I think it might have highlighted the fact, because um, uh, a big part of that was them focusing on making sure that musical bit went well and that it um, had that effect on people I, I wonder if I wonder if um, this might also show why the first half of the movie was so disjointed perhaps it's because it was sort of reverse engineered after focusing so much more on the killing joke that they, they, they then went back and decided to that might have played into it it feels that way by the amount of focus that in that bit they, they show on so you reckon that once the movie was made in house everyone mm-hmm. watched it and decided um, okay we've, we have a lot of bad things happening in this movie mm-hmm. um, and um, and we kind of want to emphasize or re-emphasize to the audience how we did it um, and what went into the madness because I think one of the guys, um, who, I think it was the one of the composers or directors. Yeah, he did say that he went a little bit mad while composing for <laughs> um, the mo- for the movie, and I think it does have a huge impact to people who do touch the story in yeah, general. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, uh, the movie does end um, with. Uh, a uh, a, a good conversation, not, not not a battle, but a conversation between Batman and the Joker. Um, how Batman wants to rehabilitate Joker and almost be allies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a very strong tone of that alliance yeah. in the in that, um, and it's it was such a good scene, really, and I think it works. Well, both in the comic and the, and the movie, mm. um, and it's not the first time you see Batman, you know, trying to help the Joker. Exactly, in different mediums, not just um, this movie. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but I guess it's just he's accepted the like he's accepted the point. Like he's accepted 
the, the result or the conclusion of one of these days I want to either kill you or you to kill me mm -hmm. so how do you want to do this basically and uh, it made me think instantly of uh, one of my favorite pieces of work in the Batman mythos being Dark Knight Returns oh by um, Frank Miller uh, Frank Miller Frank yes Miller's work. because that that showcases that kind of ending to the Batman and the Joker yeah. where it just uh, spoilers for um, Dark Knight Returns where it culminates in in the death in the death of uh, Joker right? yeah so, he, he, by he throws, himself basically he, he throws a battle into Joker's eye and then Joker snaps his neck yeah he won't kill him yeah. like just to kill himself. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So at the very end, you know, Batman still can't can't do it. Yeah. Yet Joker's on the scene. See, so this is this is an interesting um, part because the movie ends very openly. Mm. Um, Joker tells a joke, and then suddenly Batman laughs, um, which is really rare. Very, very, very rare, rare for Batman to break the laugh or even break the smile yeah and it's something the Joker's wanted out of him for decades, ever. decades. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've got Batman and Joker laughing you've got a floor scene uh, with the water from the rain and then it just fades to black that's the end of the movie mm -hmm. um, there was um, I think there was a conversation with Alan Moore um on a podcast somewhere uh, where he does say that Batman does kill the Joker in that scene mm. now I think it was I, I, I knew that before going into the movie and I was kind of expecting just ha <laughs> crack mm. um, and that would have been the end of the movie but I think it was good that they left it as an open thing for interpretation absolutely um, I think that's how the graphic novel ends yes um, in fact in the, sorry go on oh, well, it's, um, yeah the one thing I didn't like about that one actually was they didn't because in the comic they got the panel and it's um, as it ends they actually have the visual imagery of the joke you just said mm -hmm. with, with the um, sirens because the cops are there you can see the police sirens and like the lights and um there's like a beam of light that slowly diminishes, like the um, uh, light shining on the beam in his joke, yeah. which just slowly goes out as it goes down. So rather than um, the movie, where just there's nothing there and mm. kind of goes down. Just quickly, would we call that joke the killing joke? Is that the killing joke? Is that literally? Yeah. Uh, I yeah. Guess, okay. I that would. Okay. That would. That would. That would make sense. Yes. Um, well. Yeah. Well. That's. Yeah. It's definitely a. a nicer in, in the, although in the movie I like how they sort of fade into just rain sounds in the background yeah, yeah. Um, that was quite nice but and that's probably where half the audience just left saying yes like what the fuck did I just watch, <laughs> watch. yeah but I, I yeah I mean it'd be so significant um, whatever happened in that scene if if, if Batman did kill Joker it would go against uh, the the words of let's call him warning that um Gordon gave him before he went into Chase. Joker. I want this by the, the book. book. Exactly. Yeah. Um, exactly. Uh, and if and Batman is the very symbol of that, really, that that way should work. Mm -hmm. So if he does kill the Joker, that would be very, very momentous. Mm -hmm. um, so momentous, in fact, that I wonder if it would really just deserve like a definite outcome. I mean, you can, of course, wonder, wonder it in the interpretation. That's fine. Um, I think though if if you want to make a move like that of that caliber perhaps have it be definitive would make it more significant yeah. I find you would kind of redefine Batman in a way oh definitely or um, technically bring him back well bring him back to his origins yeah, yeah. Um, all that progress they made just yeah like, because like not many not many not many people do know the original Batman does kill people the, Bob Kane's Batman had guns at one stage um, and so I think yeah uh, so I think they wanted to move away from that violent guy who just kept killing people mm -hmm. um, so yeah that would um, lose all progression in the last yeah. one 
50 or so years. I think I'm a fan of that progression. Honestly, I think that's one of the reasons you respect Batman so much as a character is that clear line of separation. Unless you watch Batman v Superman. Oh, God. Yeah, which we're was... We're not here to talk about Batman. Yeah. We're, not, we're not here to talk about Batman v Superman. That would require... But if you go and... Ba- ba- like, Batman killed people in Batman v Superman. No, he does it in the comic books and no, he does it in, the, in any other piece of medium. Yeah. Oh, he did... He did a little bit in, the, like, the... Um, in the Tim Burton... Oh, no, in Michael Caine. In the Nolan North movies, he killed... He had a hand in killing Two-Face. He basically just tossed him off the old... And was a ghoul. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and to extend, yes, right, so will, and yeah. also Bane allowing just getting a, him shot by uh, Catwoman. Not, not, not Michael Caine. Um, who's the guy who played Michael Burton? Keen. Michael Keane. He killed about two people. Yeah, he pretty much put a guy on fire. Both movies he killed two people. Like, yeah. The Joker, <laughs> and also his main henchman, the Church Bell. And then, um, that movie returns, I think. The second one with Catwoman. Um, basically blows some guy up. Um, that is whole Christmas people. Um, so yeah, Batman doesn't necessarily yes. kill people, like kills people intentionally, but he kills yeah. people. Mm. They, they took it way to the extreme. In BBS? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, back to the killing joke. Absolutely. Because we, we can have a completely different podcast about Batman v Superman. Uh-huh. And I'm sure we will one day. Why um, not? On this channel. Um, so you know, we, we can leave it to interpretation as to what happens to Joker at the end of yeah. the killing joke. But do you think that this is the end of Mark Hamill's Joker? Man, I mean, you know... Like, he has he has been announced to come back in a more light-hearted Justice League cartoon. Um, well, you already answered your question. Well, that's true, <laughs> but, like, he's... The tone of this Joker now... The Dark Joker yeah. is now perhaps, perhaps yeah. d- like gone. Maybe. I mean, I no. think even then, be a good, this one's probably a good way to send it off, though. Yeah. And just go on to other interpretations of the Joker. Like, you could even interpret it as Batman, Kevin Conroy, kills Mark Hamill. Yeah. Yeah. And this is yeah. <laughs> great, a great end scene to do for that interpretation. Because they do make a good team. Oh, so good. And but, um, I don't know, like, because how many times did he say he's not going to do it? Just the once. Yeah. Okay. Um, depends. I think mean, it depends on the storyline. Like, if another great arc comes out or something. You know. But you really need to convince yeah. Mark Hamill. Because after Arkham City, he said, okay, I'm going to retire my voice from Joker, um, but I really want to do the killing joke. Like, Warner Brothers, bring me back for the killing joke. Mm. Um so, yeah, unless you like get a, someone makes uh, a story that's so powerful, like more powerful than the Killing Joke, yeah. and you convince Mark Hamill to do it, this may be the last time we see this version of the Joker. Mm-hmm. I'd actually love to see Long Halloween adapted. That's just me. Oh, I don't, don't, don't remember the contents of that story. A lot just of the time. So much of it is probably in the inspiration, like um, for the, the whole plot of Dark Knight. Mm. A lot of it um, with Two Face and Aladdin, those gangsters. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's like, like basically shows off his rogues gallery. It's really good. Like um, uh, 1996, I think it was. Um, this killer is killing members of the mob over an entire, uh, basically over like a whole all the celebratory um, days. Year. Like goes, I mean, it spends a whole year. Shows um, a version of Two Faces' origin. Right. Joker's not in it that much. I don't recall. I think he's like he has his own little prank, like his own little, little scheme for one issue. Yeah. I think it was Christmas or Halloween. I can't remember which one. Right. Um, right. Valentine's Day or whatever. And I'm um, thinking it's back towards the end when all the rogues meet, um, unite against him. Hmm. But yeah, um, I don't see him going back for that. Sadly. So, I'm trying I'm trying to remember in in the um, in the video game series, it's Mark Hamill who does all of them. No, he, he does the main kind of trilogy. But he wasn't in in Origin, which was, I think he did uh, Arkham true. Asylum, Arkham City, and that's it. And Arkham Knight, he came back for that. Oh no, Arkham Knight. Okay. No, that was Troy Baker. Was it? it was Actually, Troy Baker. Damn. 
Troy yeah. Baker was. Um, okay, well, yeah, half and half. Then Troy Baker was in Origin and then Knight in Premier League. Yeah. yeah. Well, because I enjoyed Troy Baker and in, in uh, Origins. In fact, if we're talking about Joker styles, um, Troy Baker is pretty close. Yeah. 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 Second, close second. So if you yeah if if, uh, if it wasn't Mark Hamill definitely he could carry that torch of the Joker yeah. I yeah. think I, I was think. I was good at joking and say we could always just wait for Troy Baker <laughs> yeah. for the next ones um, but the issue with Troy Baker is he does a lot of character work um, so you can't identify Troy Baker as the Joker where we can identify Mark Hamill as um, Luke Skywalker we can't identify Mark Hamill as the Joker you can also arguably identify Mark Hamill as Wolverine in a Wolverine game um, but yeah. he's not known for that no. like Troy Baker's known for what Joel Booker do it um, mm. mainly but I mean I feel like a lot of that just depends on you know what people have experienced I mean I I haven't I don't think anyway have had any content with Troy Baker other than Arkham Origins so as far as I'm concerned for example he is your second Joker. Yes. So it's possible for that to happen, but you're right. For most people who have enjoyed most of, of the other content he's been in, it definitely wouldn't be the same. Um, in fact, I mean, in general, whenever I, whenever I hear voice actors, voice actors across different medias, it, it always have, it has an interesting effect on me. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. Most of the time, the, the actors are talented enough to... Um, make the separation between characters strong enough where it doesn't matter to yeah. them. Yeah. So I think, you know, given enough talent, a voice actor can break whatever stigma they might have from different roles they might have played. So for our generation, though, um, we'll get back to the point of uh, Mark Hamill's first 10 minutes where he does say that um, we are the generation where wherever, whenever we read a comic book, we all hear Mark Hamill's voice. Mm -hmm. um, and his laugh. And his laugh, um, and maybe arguably Troy Baker's, but mainly Mark Hamill's, because they're so damn similar. Yes, yeah, I'd, I'd say that. Yeah, the reason for that they probably Troy Baker probably wouldn't have been got actually consistency with the voices. Yeah, like he's basically playing a younger version of Mark Hamill's Joker. So. Yeah, he yeah. probably didn't go into it with a piece of paper saying "Don't do Mark." <laughs> I, I think don't, don't, Mark, it was a don't one. do Nicholson. Okay. Yeah, mate, we're gonna do the same thing here. Don't do Hamill. <laughs> I reckon you probably would have. I wouldn't be surprised. And that's probably Ledger. what Jared Leto has done, or someone has done to Jared Leto. Don't do Ledger. Don't do yeah, Ledger. Yeah, don't do Ledger. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I like Leto's laugh so far. That's about all I have on him, though. He, the Suicide Squad's going to be an interesting movie. It will be. Um, I'm, I'm sure that we will cover this content when that movie comes out mm. next month. Yeah, August 4th, I want to say, or 5th. Mm. So actually, it's about a week or maybe. A week or so. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking, yeah, a week. Yeah. Um, but I think, it should we, like, to wrap this podcast up and to relate it back to The Killing Joke, because we have dwelled into a lot of the Batman mythos mm. and the history of Batman in uh, the context of movies and animation and, and comic books. Um, will you, A... Buy the Killing Joke on Blu-ray and DVD. Um, well, I, yeah, I mean, this is an unfair answer because I don't do it habitually, so probably no. No. Um, but um, I might be tempted. Tim? Yeah, I'd say the same thing because I don't um, buy the animated DVDs or anything. I usually watch them any way I can. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I'd say the comics probably more than enough for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look, personally, I would like to buy it because it is um, based on what has transpired in recent days. It is um, a piece of pop culture history. Mm -hmm. um, we also got to remember that uh, comic books um, aren't just storytelling; they're there to, you know, question society and. Um, retell different things uh, so I think that Killing Joke does um, affect some sort of hot topic I'm sure I'm sure many comic books do like um, you know talk about other issues in society 
um, especially I think Dark Knight Returns mm. draws into the politics. Yes. Um, um, so I like I will buy it and rewatch it a couple of times on a more analytical scale. Yeah. Um, and just see, uh, you know, what this movie is truly about, and you know, uh, see how Bruce Tim has come in the, like come about in the last twenty years. Um, second question is, would you recommend it to other people? Um, would those other people? How much would they know about the film? Jockey? Well, let, let's say that um, the general audience. Like okay. if you were a salesperson and you want to promote this movie, um, which is probably a bad analogy. <laughs> um, as as okay, let's let, let's rephrase that. Um, would you recommend this to your friends? Sure, I try to not um, hype them as much as I was for this movie. I tried maybe to curb the excitement a little, but I definitely recommend it. It's not. I, I definitely wouldn't say don't watch it. Yeah, you know? definitely good enough to sit down and enjoy. Yep, I also would recommend this. Mm. I wouldn't hype it up also, just say this is an adaptation on one of the best, probably definitely one of the best Batman comics ever. Mm-hmm. And um, a really good one for the Joker, so I'd check it out. Yeah. I wouldn't, obviously I'm not going to say, oh yeah, this happens. <laughs> yeah, this happens and this so, happens yeah. and this happens. <laughs> it's really controversial, so yeah. I don't want it because I'm <laughs> spoiling it. So. Um, well, I've accidentally spoiled it to a few people already, oh. <laughs> um, but I would recommend this. Yeah. You're the best panda. <laughs> <laughs> I am the best. Don't, don't ever leave any secrets to me. Um, I would, I would recommend this movie, um, but also to like the point you guys are saying. I don't, I don't. I would not um, tell them this is a really good movie. Like watch, watch this movie if you've got time. It is an interesting movie. Um, just don't have any expectations of what it should be or what it can be going in um, solely because uh, the general people would expect some sort of crazy Nolan movie or yeah. Zack Snyder movie or there's action mm-hmm. and detective work and crazy dialogue like this is um, this is uh, this is an identity movie yeah um, if you want to know about the Joker watch this movie um, so guys, I think we should, uh, we're going to wrap this up. Mm-hmm. Thank Emilio for coming. My pleasure. Thank Tim for coming. Hopefully you guys uh, will come back for other DC related or movie co- related content in the future. Absolutely. Guaranteed if it's a Batman in it, I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> we can always talk about Suicide Squad when it comes out. We can do that. Yeah. Um, the Ultimate Edition is out, so um, ah, true. I do want to get my hands on that. Mm-hmm. and. See what the extra thirteen minutes of content is. Yes. Is it an R rating or? It's that? it's yeah it is an R rated oh, movie God. now. Yeah. It went from a PG movie to an R rated movie. With fifteen extra minutes. With thirty extra minutes of yeah. R. Um, so guys, uh, we're, we're gonna leave it there. Um, look, the Killing Joke is out um, at various distributors. I know that JB is selling them um, on the third of August. The third of August. Um, I'm sure other outlets will sell it on Blu-ray and DVD as well. Um, and hopefully you guys, you know, enjoy the movie or think about... I mean, hopefully hopefully you guys have seen the movie before listening to all of this. I didn't point it out before. Um, but if you guys see it again, you know what we think. And see you on the next podcast. <laughs>